So in addition to being a story of the history of Unix and Linux documentation, this is also a story of how ideas evolve or sometimes don't across lots and lots of decades, and also how code and solutions that you think are temporary, that you intend to be temporary, that you tell your colleagues are temporary, uh, may end up not being. Uh, in this talk, I'm also going to cover the history of the tools used to make man pages, which delightfully some of you are familiar with. Uh, who was involved in their initial creation? Uh, hint, it involves some names that have already been said on the stage today. And then what you need to know to create your own man pages, which my sincere hope is by the end of this, you will all be super psyched to do so, or at least other documentation. Um, yeah, my name is Brianne Boland. I'm an engineer and a writer, and depending on the various needs of my employers across the years, either a documentation fan or zealot. Um, I'm also a man page reader. I tend to read one per workday. Um, my favorites include uh, Man Bash, for which I recommend setting aside an afternoon and maybe a pot of tea of moderate caffeination, because it's a big one. And then more recently, I really liked SSH and SSH-keygen, because they do what I think the best man pages do, which is to both explain what you need to do to use a utility, but also give you a picture of how systems work and how computers communicate, and even some standard uh, directory structure. So you come out of it knowing how to SSH, but also knowing something greater that you can apply. Um, I'm also coming at this from a Linux and Mac perspective. The organization and requirements of man pages vary somewhat across OSs, and I'm not going to be touching on that here. Oh, so let's go back to the beginning. Uh, who here has looked at a man page in the last month? My people, yay. Um, that's awesome. So at their most basic, they're a manual or a bit of documentation for a utility that you would use on the Unix or Linux command line. Um, for the three of you who are less, maybe less familiar with this, this is the man page for cat, which is a tool that among other things will print the contents of a file to your terminal so you can look at it without opening it in another program. It's also a really, really direct bit of lineage that goes straight back to a really formative era of computer science and to the birth of Linux and one of the many very productive areas of Bell Labs. And sadly, they're also often regarded as being very dry, uh, something you have to look at, you're not excited to look at. But again, hopefully by the end of this, maybe you'll feel a little bit differently. So man pages share a birth date with Unix, uh, November 3rd, 1971. And they were created using a formatting tool that dates to 1964. Uh, I'll get into that a bit more shortly. So they started out as a single binder of man pages. Um, and in later versions of the Unix programmer's manual, that just formed the first binder of many volumes. Um, hello, familiar names. So they were created because uh, Doug McElroy informed Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie that they would be responsible for writing the documentation for Unix. Uh, kind of how most documentation is made today. Your manager says you're going to do it, and then you do it. And this is one of those original man pages. Uh, this is for Seek. And even though it's evolved a little bit, it's really pretty instantly recognizable as a man page. Uh, that format and the nature of the information in it has been pretty consistent since 1971. Uh, since then, there are, there's the version that you can access in the terminal, but there are also a number of online repos that you can access. And I'll describe those more in a bit because there are a lot of really passionate people involved in those too. So you can find them online. Um, if you want to be efficient about it, say man page in the utility you're looking for. If you want to be less efficient and a little more entertaining, <laughs> you can leave out the page, still get the information you want, and get to say hi to Bubbles. So that's all right. Uh, bringing it up to the present, uh, man pages are the, one of the surest tells that your utility might be worth a damn that you've given it the attention that it needs, that you have been mindful about creating something useful. Um, if there's no man page or other documentation, it's a pretty quick bit of revelation that maybe your software is not especially safe to adopt. But let's go even further back. <laughs> back to 1964, when Jerome Seltzer had a doctoral thesis proposal to format and print. So what else are you going to do? Write your own formatting tool to do so. It was brought into Bell Labs in 1967 by Rudd Cannaday, who adapted it and renamed it ROF. And it was brought in for prototyping on a porting project. And again, prototyping, best intentions, but uh, yeah, well. 
it was used for five more years, including for the first three versions of the uh, Unix documentation. The next version was NROF for new ROF, and that was written by Joe Osana, also at Bell Labs, and that was the first version that included programmable macros. 1973 brought TROF, um, originally in PDP-11 assembly, later in C. This was also Joe Osana's work. And this one stuck around longer than he intended because he died fairly early and wasn't able to finish the work that he intended to complete. It was picked up in 1979 as DITROF, Device Independent Trof, uh, mm -hmm. throwing off the chains of the WAN graphic system cat type setter. And this was when Brian Kernigan began being involved. And he oversaw it for a number of years, added things like the ability to use dynamic memory, um, adding UTF encoding. And this is the ROF from which all current ROFs now flow. Uh, because actually the source code for ROF is lost. They've recovered a lot of original Unix code from the original tapes, but ROF is not among it. So at this point, we know it exists just through beautiful memories and artifacts. But the ROF you've most likely interacted with, at least in the last 20 odd years, is GROF, which is now the default on most new and Linux OSs. Uh, this was written by James C. Clark, who was also the technical lead on the working group that created XML. Um, and if you look up a man page on a Mac, for instance, this is the utility that formats it. But what about you? You are looking at man pages in 2016. Mm -hmm. So who manages the archive? Uh, the answer is it varies. Uh, one of the biggest, most actively managed archives is man7.org. And that's overseen by a man called Michael Karisk. He's the third overseer of this. Uh, he's overseen it since 2004. And at this point, because he's had the specific goal to fill in gaps of man pages, he's authored or co-authored fully a third of the pages in that archive. Um, there are a couple other archives. Uh, Die.net is also very good, kernel.org. But what about new utilities and programs? That responsibility generally goes to someone on the team, someone who probably was informed by their boss. So today you're writing documentation, strap in. That's how your life's going to go today. And if you inherit a utility, in addition to upkeeping the code, you're also responsible, responsible for keeping up the documentation. The ones in your terminal, however, those come with your OS, or they're installed later by utilities you might add if they use a man page in lieu of online documentation. Uh, you can see every man page available on your system if you go to user slash share slash man. And if you go to that directory, you'll notice a number of uh, numbered directories, and I'll tell you exactly what that means. Because I'm sure you're all exceptionally psyched, as excited as I am to write man pages and better this world that we all have to live in. Okay, so there, there are a couple systems of organization that you need to know to do this effectively. And the first one is how man pages are organized. And you saw some of this in the first presentation, actually. Those uh, numbers that are in parentheses, they refer to what section in the original physical manual they would have been in. And at this point, it's just a tell of the kind of utility that you're dealing with. Uh, so for instance, said make an awk are all in section one, uh, strace is two, exit's three, and then netstat and fdisk are eight, just to give you an idea. Now one extra interesting thing here is there are some utilities, and one of them is man, where if you look at their entries in different sections, you get very different information. It's like man one tells you flags and formatting and basically what you need to do to use that utility mm -hmm. in the terminal. Man seven, and that's where the name of that uh, big archive comes from, mm -hmm tells you formatting and GROF information and what you need to know to make your own man pages. The second important piece of organization is organization within the page. So this is a list of, uh, for Linux, every section that can be in a man page in the order they are supposed to go in. Now, of course, not every one of these goes in every man page because they would be enormous and basically unusable. But you are strongly encouraged that if you have information you feel you need to put in a man page, to not invent, to just figure out which section matches the information you want to include, and just go with that, just to make it as simple as possible for the user so they know what to expect and don't have to guess and relearn every time they just want to know how your utility works. Um, yeah, my favorite sections, I get really delighted when I see, uh, see also examples and versions. Versions, it doesn't pop up often enough, but you get a little bit of history of what the utility uh, went through to get to the state that you're dealing with today. Uh, the evolutions that it's gone through, dead ends that were abandoned, and uh, sometimes utilities that it replaces. And C also can tell you the same thing. Uh, in addition to saying, you know, these are things that are thematically related, something that the writer of the man page thinks that you would gain something from reading in addition to that man page, 
you can sometimes see the utility it was meant to replace. And then the one that's most especially dear to my heart is examples, which are not included nearly often enough. Um, they are the best, most direct way that you can tell your future user exactly what you meant for them to do. Because otherwise, you are making a new engineer go through this beautiful letter salad right here. Which of course, if you read the entire page becomes clear, you get the information that you want and it's brilliant. But if you just have a server that's misbehaving and someone's breathing down your neck and you just need to fix it or else everything including your career is going to explode, you don't really want to Rosetta Stone this. You just want to know a few examples of how to start going. So if you have the chance to write examples, I ask you, please do, they're wonderful. But let's get into the formatting itself. Uh, man page formatting is its own special beast. Uh, tags go at the beginning of each line that need to be formatted, so a page would say .th and then the, the uh, title of it. Uh, each section header gets a little sh tag ahead of it. And then of course you can do text formatting like bold and italic. And then HP, IP, and TP are some of those macros that do that really instantly recognizable man page formatting where you have the subcommand or flag here and then the explanation over here. So for comparison, to go back to mancat, uh, this is the code for it on my machine. So you can see section headers there and just get a sense of generally how it's laid out. And for comparison, if not exactly contrast, Here's some text that's formatted for that original runoff utility that Jerome Saltzer used for his 1964 doctoral thesis proposal. It's evolved a little bit, gotten more complex, but overall it hasn't veered wildly from its source. Um, a few conclusions for you. Things I hope you keep in mind when you walk out of here. Um, work like it's permanent. Uh, your intentions, the things that you say with great earnestness to your coworkers, the things you put in beautifully phrased, deep, completely unignorable comments. No one cares after a while. Does it work? Brilliant, let's go. So don't assume that your prototype stopgap is going to be considered as such because there's a very good chance, uh, especially if you're look, working at Bell Labs and MIT in the 60s and 70s, that your stuff's gonna be pretty persistent. So make it count and make it something that if it sticks around, you're gonna be okay with that. Uh, documentation's important. It's a lot easier to stand on the shoulders of giants if you have something telling you where those shoulders might be. So yeah, prioritize documentation. It's a kindness to your users. It's also the best possible way for future people to know the true depth of your brilliance. It's worth the time. Uh, if you have the opportunity, include examples. It's a kindness. Mm. And finally, if you have a utility that you take for granted and you get a little bit curious of where it comes from, I do really suggest looking into it. It's really worth it. Things become standards because other options were put forward and then fell off. Uh, and if something is considered so classic that it's the default, probably some really good, careful, long-term decisions went into making it. And it can be really educational and you can end up, like me, spending a lot of time reading Wikipedia information about Bell Labs, which is endlessly gratifying. Uh, a few resources for you. Um, if you are too fancy for the terminal or you just like to know how long the thing you're reading is without hitting enter 400 times, uh, the Linux Man Pages project at kernel.org is quite good. Um, its special thing is that you can get all the pages as a tarball and hold them and feel infinitely powerful knowing you have all the information. And then man7.org and die.net are both really worthwhile. They're just well organized and thorough and if you need a man page, you can you know, rely on their information. And then some compliments if you're just looking for more general learning. Uh, after I read a man page, most often I'll do a search that's just utility and examples. And someone out there picked up on the fact that people are thirsty for this. There are lots and lots of clickbaity listicles giving you a lot of example options. Um, I'm not saying the pros surrounding those options is stellar, but I have yet to find one with examples that are crap. So they're pretty good resources. And then for more general things, uh, the illustrations of Julia Evans and then bubble sort zines are a couple of resources that have emerged recently where sometimes they address exactly the kind of information that man pages cover. Sometimes it's more general computer science topics, but I find them just a really nice complement to modern documentation. And if you want to learn more specifically about the man pages and the making of them and the history of them, and uh, I'm about to show you a really ugly URL. There's a pretty one at the end, so don't worry. So this is an archive of a 2011 research project about the history of man page formatting 
and it includes a lot of uh, emails and other correspondence with a lot of the original players, so it's a pretty great read. It is massively in-depth and has so much more information than, than could have gone into a 20-minute presentation. I also suggest looking at the credits of every man page that you look at, because if you read enough of them, you'll start to recognize names or at least institutions and get a really nice sense of where your career and work are intersecting with other people's, which is pretty cool. Uh, man Man is worth a look, uh, not just because it's fun to type, but especially if you compare them between sections one and seven, and then between different maintainers, because the, the people that oversee man page archives get very opinionated, um, which I love. I've written many style guides. I'm very opinionated, so I really like seeing other people doing the work, too. And finally, every link I've mentioned, plus some more, plus all the information I covered here, is at trust.work slash blog. And that is probably the most mansplaining I will ever do in my entire life. And I am so happy to have shared it with you.